Hi, this is Harold Long. Welcome to the Hill Tran United Weekly Message and Podcast. I'm glad you're making time for this week's teaching. I will have more to say at the end, but for now, let's dive right in. So our scripture reading for today is Job chapter 11, verses 7 through 12 from the message. Do you think you can explain the mystery of God? Do you think you can diagram God Almighty? God is far higher than you can imagine, far deeper than you can comprehend, stretching farther than Earth's horizons, far deeper than the endless ocean. If he happens along and throws you in jail, then hands you into court, can you do anything about it? He sees through vain pretensions, spots evil a long way off. No one pulls the wool over his eyes. Hollow men, hollow women will wise up about the same time as mules learn to talk. May God's bless you in the hearing and the understanding and the application of this scripture. Good morning. morning. Thanks, Pastor Harold Long. For those who might be watching online or listening after the fact, I am the teaching pastor here. It's great to be with you this morning. We are in a message series and and growth campaign titled 40 Days of Prayer for this Lenten season. In your bulletin, you have a lesson plan. I would encourage you to pull that out. You also have space in your side of your bulletin for some notes and some reflection questions as well to to be reflecting on today as we go to today's message. Today's message is titled Praying in Five Dimensions. I don't know if you know what that is i had to kind of look up what what a dimension was but it's 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 a point to point line basically it's a dimension you got one it's one dimension you have a second it's a two dimension and then you get to the fourth dimension and uh the fourth dimension is debated a lot in scientific circles as is it the fourth dimension representing the value of time is that really what it represents there's some debates on that but then you have this fifth dimension and what is the fifth dimension? Some of you remember that band, the fifth dimension. Some of you are old enough to remember them, right? You got some of their tunes in your car. Mickey's like, yeah, I got the CD going right now. They had some hits like Up, Up, and Away. Some of you remember that song or Last Night. Uh, then they had Aquarius, which was a great song. And, uh, and I, probably my favorite fifth dimension song was Working on a Groovy Thing, if you remember that tune. Not, you got iPhones and Google Play or Android phones, you can download a little fifth dimension music today and go back, you know, and be nostalgic. But, uh, but fifth dimension means an attempt to unify the four fundamental forces of nature, which are a strong nuclear force, a weak nuclear force, gravity, and electromagnetism. And Jason will be very proud of me that I know that. And, but the reality of it is it's so far out of our space and time that we can't see it, so it's really irrelevant to us today. But there is the fifth dimension, but we're talking about the fifth dimensions and praying in five dimensions because, number one, and you'll see it in your handout here, hit my handy-dandy little clicker here going, you'll see it, is that God is a multi-dimensional God. And I think that's important because as we've looked it up through this prayer series, how you see God, how you experience God, how you understand God will determine a lot how your prayer life goes. Big time. There's a direct correlation between those two facets. Do I see God as my father, which we'll talk about a lot today? And, and we can see God in a lot of ways. And this is really where we're going with this message. This message today will allow us to to explore some of those spaces and time. We see God in creation. You've been around long enough and, and, and enjoyed what you see out in the world, whether it's the trees, it's the water, it's the skies, it's the sunsets, it's the rainbows. If you've been on any travel excursions, because we know we have world travelers here, you've been all around the world and you've seen some amazing things. And you cannot look at it and just have your breath taken away that that is from God, that God created that. That just, just didn't happen. You can, so you can see God's fingerprints on a lot of things. You can call it a sixth sense. We have our five senses, but you can call it the sixth sense in life, especially as you start to grow spiritually. You start to see God's fingerprints on a lot of things. And there's nothing else you can say, though, but that's, that's the mystery of God, and that's powerful. 
This scripture that Donna read for us this morning is a conversation that we see. But in Romans 1.20 it says, Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities and eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen in what has been made so that men are without excuse. And so we have no excuse because we can see God in nature. There's, you can't push back or argue against that. And you say, well, what about the person who's never heard the gospel? You know, what excuse they have? Well, they, they see God all over the place. If you study history, if you study the Native Americans and way back as far as the earliest people, they were worshiping a spirit. They were worshiping a God. They were drawing pictures. They were doing emojis long before we had iPhones and caves, trying to describe this experience and what they saw and what they felt and what they, they witnessed uh, with God to the stars to the heavens onward. And so we're without excuse. We have, we were created for relationships. So we have this automatic energy in connection with God, but we can see it in God's creation. And, uh, and if you stop, it's, it's amazing to, uh, to look at. In this conversation with Job that we see, and you see that in your outline, this is a conversation, you know, that Job's having with God. He's whining about his life at the moment. And God, this is God's response to him. Can you fathom the limits and bounds of greatness and power of God? The sky is no limit for God, but it lies beyond your reach. God knows the world of the dead, but you do not know it. God's greatness is broader than the earth and wider than the sea. And see, you know, you know in school we learned about evolution, and the first time I heard about evolution, it blew my faith apart. I mean, it really did. I mean, it just watered up my faith and threw it in the trash because that's not how I came. It's not what I understood about God. And now they give me this idea that the world's 4.5 billion years old and that it's evolved and we we came out of monkeys or whatever. And here's where we are today. And that was a complete shock to me. And it really blew my faith apart. And it happens for a lot of people that way. I can just water up my faith that day and threw it out before I walked out of class and really just discounted what I've been taught through scripture and church and Sunday school. That was a real challenge for me. And then you get the big bang theory. But here's what I know. Here's what I believe. I don't have a problem with the big bang, but somebody pulled the trigger. All right? So I just, just think about that. Somebody pulled the trigger on the big bang. So whether the earth is 4.5 billion or it's 10,000 years old, I don't care. You can wrestle with that all you want. But what I'm telling you is God's divinity is there. If you walked around the church, and all of a sudden you saw a Rolex laying in the grass. You know that just didn't get there by itself, right? You just know that didn't happen. If you saw a rock sitting there, you would say it's no big deal. That's just, it belongs there. But if you saw a Rolex laying there, you would know that was out of place. And you know that it just didn't evolve by itself. It just didn't create itself, and one day there's a watch that's ticking and tells time, and it's cool when you can go pawn it for a lot of money. It's not, you know that. You know, it's so that that so you see God in creation. I think it's important to, to know that and get that big time in life uh, to subscribe. To, I, I just don't have enough faith to be an atheist because there's, there's just too much evidence alone in, the, in creation by itself. Just by itself. There's too much evidence. I mean, to subscribe to the Big Bang evolution that there's no intelligent design behind it. it's like believing that there was an explosion at the salvage yard and when it was the dust settled there was a brand new 747 ready to fly you know i mean that's the, that's the, what you're asking for it's just i can't put i couldn't begin to put my hands around that your next one that you see in your handout is we see jesus incarnation god became flesh the fact that god can become flesh is multi-dimensional means he can do a lot of different things. This is the mystery of it. But God became flesh. He came in the form of Jesus, right? And this is what the scripture says, John 1, 4, 1, 14. The word became a human being and lived among us. We saw his glory and he was full of grace and truth. And that's awesome, friends. That's, that's a fact that we can't deny as Christians. And, and, and that's how we see God as multi Dimensional, big time, in our lives. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. <clears throat> so God is past, present, and future. God always was, always is, always will be. 
And, and we just need to embrace that and we need to live into that. And there's a lot of mystery behind that. There's a lot of questions we all have. There's a lot of questions science has that it can't answer. There's, you know, there's on and on and on and on. But the bottom line is, I don't, I don't know everything there is to know about electricity, but I'm not going to sit in the dark till I do. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? I mean, that's kind of what we're talking about. I'm going to walk in faith and trust the process. And not everything's going to be revealed to me on this side of heaven. But one day, those, those questions will be answered. Revelation 1.4, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and is to come. Again, there's no binding God up on space and time. God is who God is. God does what God does. And, and so here we are 2,000 years you know, removed from when Jesus walked on the earth. And it's challenging sometimes in a relative space and time. It's like, well, you know, even the early believers thought Jesus was going to come back in their time. And so here we are 2,000 years later. When is this, the kingdom of God going to be restored on earth as it is in heaven? When are we going to experience that? But Jesus himself said, nobody knows that they are the hour that's going to happen. Nobody knows. So even the Son of Man, the Lord himself, does not know when that's going to happen. So if that is the case, then I don't have to get lost in that. I just need to trust the process and do what God's asked me to do while I'm here. And next in your outline is we see it in how the Holy Spirit moves. And we watch this exchange between Nicodemus and, and John, but here it is. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you don't know where it, the wind comes from or where it's going. That's the way it is with everyone born of the Holy Spirit. So you can't put the Holy Spirit in a box. If you watched, if you went with us last week to the movie, there was 55 of us that went and seen Jesus' revolution. But you can see the Holy Spirit work in, in, that, in that context, a dark context. And that's what I loved about the movie because it showed people's shortcomings. It showed their humanness. But even despite their brokenness, God used them in a mighty way and continues to use them in a mighty way. And you can't limit the Holy Spirit. And we have the Holy Spirit with us. When we give our lives to Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells with inside us. And that's a powerful thing. But we can't contain it. But yet we can see it. We can see the Spirit working in the world. We can see the Spirit of God touching lives and touching situations. Maybe not necessarily right in the middle of the explosion, but when the dust settles and we look back in hindsight, we can see God's fingerprints and influence on that situation. And that's powerful. I think for all of us. Job 9, verses 10 through 11. He does wonders that cannot be understood. He does so many miracles they cannot be counted. When he passes me, I can't see him. And when he goes by me, I do not recognize him. So the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit is multi-dimensional. And that's really power. There's no the one-dimensional praying. There's no two-dimensional praying. You know, if we're limited to that, then prayer is boring if it's just one-dimensional. But when we learn to pray, that we can pray to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, to the creator of the universe. So many ways we can connect and pray and, and, and have intimacy with God, and it's powerful. And this is what our scriptures are reminding us today. Because God is multi-dimensional, I am never alone. And I think that's really imperative to know that. And listen to this in, in the Psalms. Psalm 139, 7 through 12. Where could I go to escape from you? Where could I ever get from your presence? If I went up to heaven, you'd be there. If I lay down in the world of the dead, you'd be there. If I flew way beyond the east or lived in the furthest place to the west, you'd be there to lead me. You'd be there to help me. I could ask the darkness to hide me, but even darkness is not dark for you, and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are the same to you. Really important, I think, to understand that we can't hide from God just because we're not in church or just because we're not opening the Bible or we're not listening to Christian radio or we're not living a Jesus-centered life doesn't mean we are out of focus or out of God's sight. You know, it's, it's that old saying, you know, mom had eyes in the back of her head. You know, she always seemed to know what you're doing, you know, before you ever even did it. You know, because our, our parents know us well, right? Even our spouses, if you're with them long enough, know you well. They can finish your sentences for you before you even open your mouth. You know, I can look at Susie and she already knows what I'm thinking before I even say anything. Sometimes she's corrected me and I haven't even said anything yet. You know, it's, 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 we get to know each other, right? 
and, and so God knows us. He knows every hair on our head. And may we never lose sight of that. So this morning we're going to talk about how to pray in five dimensions. And I think this is powerful. How to, we can up our game. And this is what this whole 40 days of prayer is about. It's about how to enhance our prayer life. To expand it. To recreate it. To refresh it. To reboot it if you want. To get excited. So those are the next five bullet points that we're going to go to. So number one. I look backwards to the cross. Meaning that when I start prayer, that one of the first things that I might want to think about doing is, is being gratitude for what already happened. That Jesus gave his life for everybody, for the whole world. And so I'm forgiven despite my warts and pimples, my hurts, habits and hangups, all my shortcomings, defects, sin, however you want to refer to it. Regardless of all that, I'm good with God. I'm 100% right with God. I'm not spiritually 100% mature, but I'm definitely right with God. And I have the cross and the, and the life and the resurrection of Jesus to thank for that. So that's a great place to start. And we see that in 1 Peter 18 through 19. God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life. He paid for you with the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless lamb of God. Our value is found in the cross. When you feel worthy, and sometimes even I go through these moments where I just don't feel worthy or I don't feel qualified or I feel, you know, less than, you know, this delusion of inequality, if you would, you know, uh, you know plaguing me in my life. But, but, but I get my value in life because of the cross. And so if you're in a funk, if you're in a, a, a state of depression or self-loathing or self-pity and you're feeling sorry for yourself or it just seems like life's not fair... Look back to the cross because your values in the cross. Jesus gave up his life for you. For you. All your goofiness, you know, your dorkiness, being the biggest knucklehead in Jefferson County. Despite all that, Jesus died for you. That shows your value. That's something. That's, so that's a great way to start your prayer life is to acknowledge God for who God is and look backwards to the cross. Next, I look upward to my father's loving face, meaning that I, I can have that visual, you know, that when, I don't know if you, how do you, you know, when you pray, do you just say God, do you say Lord, do you say Jesus, do you say Father, as we're taught to, if you're in the 40 days for prayer, small group study, that Pastor Rick's breaking down the uh, Our Father in two different segments, part one and part two. But that's a big part of it is our Father who art in heaven. I mean, how do you approach your prayer life when it comes to God? So we start out with the cross, but then we look at the face of God and, and, and have that imagery. Use your imagination to think about that. Romans 8, 15 through 17. You should not act like cowering, fearful slaves since God's spirit has adopted you as children into God's family. Instead, by his spirit, we simply cry out, Abba, Father. And God's spirit affirms that we are really his children. And since we now are God's child, we are also heirs with Christ and we share in both the suffering and his glory. It's, it's packed with all kinds of truth and all kinds of blessings when we think about that. That this is who God is. And that's, you know, if you go over to Jerusalem and walk through the streets of Israel, a lot of, a lot of, you'll hear a lot of children running around going, Abba, 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 Abba. I mean, they're, they're, they're calling out to their daddy. Well, that's how scripture encourages us to approach God on a very personal way. God wants my prayers to be personal. Abba, Daddy, Father. I mean, I can go to God in that capacity. Do you already? If not, I would encourage you to think about that. To have enough humility and enough gratitude and enough reverence to be able to do just that. Two is to cry out with passion. To be passionate by your prayers. It's okay to cry. It's okay to be emotional. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to have doubts. It's okay to have all these things, just like your child coming to you. Questioning things, having doubts about things. Heartbroken about things, sad about things, excited about things. You can approach God in those same ways. It's not some, you know, if God is, a, you know, it isn't like it's a job interview, you know, or, or, you're, or you've got to go see the parole officer or it's the FBI wants to talk to you. 
But if that's my mindset, then prayer becomes a duty and a drudgery. I go back to that, but it's really important because if you struggle in your prayer life, I can promise you it's more about your relationship with God and your understanding who God is than it is what, how you're praying or how you're trying to pray. I guarantee it. And so this is a common question pastors get all the time. I'm really struggling in my prayer life. What are you praying about? How do you pray? What are you reading? What are you meditating on? These are common questions that you get all the time. But I can promise you, if you peel back that onion almost every single time, if you ask them about their relationship with God, it's maybe twisted at best, or, or it's put into that category of authoritative, punitive, um, judgmental, big brother mindset. And so you, you go to head, you go to God with your tail between your legs, and you almost feel guilty for being who you are, uh, your past, present, and even future. So that's not how we're asked to go to God. And and by his spirit, we are in partnership. We are in partnership with God. And that's really important. A a good phrase to write down, it's not in your bulletin, I don't believe, your handout, but it's all three in me, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All three dwell inside you. If you give your life to Christ, then they dwell inside you. You might say, well, I don't feel it. I don't experience what Regardless, it's there. God is deep down inside you. Every man, woman, and child is this fundamental idea of God. And when you ask God into your life, God dwells inside you. And that's highly important. We see in Romans 8, 26, this quote. Also, the Holy Spirit helps us with our weakness. We often don't know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself speaks to God for us, even begs God on our behalf. And deep groanings and feelings that words cannot express. So we have the advocate, the counselor, our friend in the Holy Spirit that's with us. So even when we can't know what to pray, you know, what do you, what do you say for somebody who's really suffering? What do you say for a volleyball player who's lost both their legs? What do you say for 21 million people in Ukraine that don't have a place to live and they're out in the cold and they're just trying to get firewood to stay warm? You know, what do you say to those people? Well, sometimes you don't have to have all the words, but just know this truth that this God, this triune triune God, this Father, Son, Holy Spirit that dwells inside you and this Holy Spirit prays on your behalf when you don't know how to pray or what to say. That's a really important thing to hang on to, I believe. Next, I look inward to Jesus living inside me. Again, all three of me, I had the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We see this in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourself to see if your faith is real and growing. Test yourself. Remember that Jesus is living in you unless you failed your test. So either you're going to grow or you're going. You know, as Mother Teresa says, I say it all the time, you've got to remain green because green things are growing. So are you growing? Are you maturing? You know, are you getting growing closer to God or are you further away? Are you stagnant? Are you just sitting in a casual space? This is your own test. This is your own inventory to be thinking about those things. Proverbs 28, 13 says this. If you try to hide your sins, you will never succeed. But if you humbly confess and reject them, you will receive mercy. So in a few minutes, we're going to be going to communion. And a part of that time of communion is for God to look inside us and for us to take the darkness that's inside us and confess it to God in the privacy of our own heart. Here's where I'm falling short. Here's at least where I know I'm falling short. And, and again, there's you go in my office, there's no blue ribbons hanging on my wall for outstanding Christian of the year. You know, I'm the biggest corn dog that I know on the planet. So we all have our junk. We all have our junk. And, this, and then, so we need to confess it. And if we confess it, honestly, we receive mercy in return. Into me, see. So it's this intimacy. So think about this play on words for the word intimacy. Into me, see. That God can look into your life and see you for you. You can't hide from God. You can't, you, you can't duck and hide and, 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 and do whatever. Escape God's you know, power and, and mercy on you. So might as well just be real and be transparent, be authentic, have integrity. God, here I am. Warts, pimples, and all. Here I am. I stand before you. And, see, and, and this, so this intimacy, this intimacy, it's, it's, it's how we probably should spell intimacy as believers in a, in a mighty way. Number four, I look around and ask the Holy Spirit to use me. 
I've shared that prayer with you many times, but I'll share it with you again now. It's one of the boldest prayers you can say. It's two words. Use me. And I, I, pro, I, I challenge. I, well, let me just do it this way. I triple dog dare you <laughs> to pray that prayer and mean it. And watch out what God does with your life. It doesn't mean he's going to send you to the airport to hand out flowers or send you halfway around the globe. Although he could. But what it means, it starts in your own community. God, use me right here in my own church. There's people who need you right here. If you don't know who they are, come and talk to me. I will point them out. There's people all over this community. We talk about it all the time. One of the largest homeless growing populations in Missouri is right here in our own county. Our poverty level here is below Missouri standards. That's why we do the Christmas programs and all the things, the food drives and the women's group and, and everything they do at Christmas time here. For that very reason. And it makes a difference. But there's always something to do. So God used me. You all have gifts and talents that I'll never have. How does God want to use it? Whether it's music like Crystal and <clears throat> Deb and Nick and all the other people, Darla and everybody else, John, that come up here and share that gift with us. That's a gift. But how else are you using it? So I mean we all have this stuff. So this is this is important. And if we do that, we'll see God. In, in a multidimensional way. We'll see even our own little pet, pathetic lives, how God can use that for his glory. And you got to do it long enough to experience it. But if you do it, it's powerful. And that's what we're called to do. Romans six thirteen says this, giving yourself completely to God, every part of you since you've been given a new life and you want to be used as a tool in the hands of God, used for his good purposes. This is the attitude. This is the mindset. This is where we should be in our journey. And our last point in this five-dimensional how to pray in five dimensions is I look forward to my future and faith. And I think this is big time. We make goals for a lot of things. We make goals for retirement. The old saying is if you're, if, <clears throat> if you're failing to plan, you're planning to fail. But I want you to think about this in the context of spiritual future what God wants to do with you in the future, what God wants to do with this church in the future. You've got to be thinking ahead. You've got to live in today, but you've got to be thinking ahead and be relevant and be contextual and be, you know, the message doesn't change, but the, the how we deliver it changes. Look at how much technology's changed the world. You know, you can say, well, I'm not going to do that. Okay, well, then you'll be left behind. And I'll push back and say, how many people got the same carpet in their bathroom that they had in 1970? How many people are driving the same car they drove in 1970? You've adapted with everything else. If I asked everybody to pull out a cell phone, you would do it. So you can't say, I, I, I can't embrace the future. Yes, you can. It just takes faith. And you've got to live into it. And you've got to be willing to humble yourself and make sacrifices. You don't necessarily have to like it or agree with it or it just doesn't fit your, what you're used to or your tradition. But who cares? It's not about you. It's about the, the kingdom. It's about the advancement of the kingdom of God here and now. And so what does your future play? In our, in our small group on Thursday nights for this, this uh, 40 days of prayer, a lady from Canada, Tracy, said this. You can't get to heaven in a U-Haul. And I love that once she said it. And, and one of the guys is a songwriter, so he's working on a song for that. You can't get to heaven in a U-Haul. I think it's beautiful. But the reality is you can't take all this stuff with you. So your money and your property and, and all that stuff, how are you using it for the kingdom, for the future of the kingdom? And these are things to be thinking about because you're not taking all this stuff with you. And I don't think it was really designed to be all used up for my earthly life. And this is what God's trying to tell us, I think. So you see it here in Philippians 1.6. I'm confident of this, that God who began a good work in you will continue to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ in our life. If anyone eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord is unworthy manner, that person is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. This is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking from the cup. And friends, we're going to segue into communion now, and we're going to look at how we're going to take this message series, or this message today, this five dimensions of prayer, and we're going to apply it to our communion time to see how they fit perfectly. 
And so this is the so we we've seen that right off the bat that we have to examine ourselves. So we saw that in point number three. I look inward to Jesus living inside me. So that's part of the five dimensions. But right off the bat in communion, we have this statement. 1 Corinthians 11, 27, 31. If anyone eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, that person is guilty of sinning against the bloody and blood of the Lord. So it's an inward examination. This is why we should examine ourselves before eating the bread and drinking from the cup. This is why we say the Lord's prayers. Forgive us our trespasses. You know, but it's a, it's a space for me to confess what's going on in my life. Quit trying to act like God doesn't know about it. God knows about it, you know? And so, and, and, and it, what, some of the first words that you see in here in a minute is, is you'll see this word called remember, and we see it a lot. For it is if you eat the bread and drink the cup without recognizing, committing to the body of Christ, you're eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. And that is why many of you are weak and sick, and some have even died. But if we examine and judge ourselves, we will not be judged by God. So communion is more than just a sacrament or a means of grace. It's all that. But it's, it's so much more than that. And you can see that today in, in our scripture readings in a mighty way. This is a scripture you should, everybody should memorize the scripture. This is a scripture you can say in the shower. You can say driving to work, you can say when you first wake up, you can say it before you close your eyes at night. But you should memorize this scripture. Again, it's about searching me. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. So it's just, you know, here it is. It's a personal inventory, sharing the exact natures of our wrongs as our friends in recovery would so often lay out in, in the 12 steps, you know, the, the step five of, of sharing our entire life story. You know, just here it is, good, bad, bad, but here's my life, the truth. Search me, God. And this is the mindset we should have as we prepare our hearts to come to communion today. So here's how we bring it all home. No one loves us more than our Heavenly Father in heaven. So this is, this is the five transforming truths, if you would, about communion. Nobody loves us more than our Heavenly Father. So this is the mindset I should have when I come to the table this morning. That I know that truth. 1 Corinthians 11, 23-25 For I received from the Lord what I also passed on you. The Lord, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he gave it to you, he gave it thanks. And he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It's, it's just a highly important scripture. And we see it again here. In the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, The cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this wherever you drink it in remembrance of me. So twice he gives us that word remember. Remember who I am. Remember why you're coming here and why you're celebrating the sacrament today. Remember who I am. And think about this. I'll, I'll give you this question. When I am most, when, when are you, I should say, most likely to forget how much your Heavenly Father loves you? Friday night? Before you go out? Monday morning? When you're ready to start your week? I mean, it's really easy to forget how much God loves us, friends. Really. And the next question I would ask is, what sin or sins do I habitually fall into when I forget God loves me? So when you forget this truth that God loves you, this number one bullet point, that no one loves us more than our Heavenly Father, what do I fall prey to? What is my go-to? Is it food? Is it porn? Is it gambling? What is it? We all got this, these worldly vices that we fall trouble to, we fall prey to. Power, glory, prestige, going down the line, I can list a bunch. When we get into trouble, it's when we doubt God's love for our life. We become almost an atheistic moment. We become atheistic when I give in to the dark side of myself. We belong to each other in God's family. That's our next bullet point. We belong to God to each other in God's family. That's why we're here. That's why we come to church. We come right, I came right in the middle of the pandemic. You guys weren't even meeting at that time. 
and we got together virtually. But still, the problem with that is, and there's some people, and I'm talking the big C church, that have never made it back to church since then. They got casual with their pajamas, watching it online, watching their favorite mega preachers or whatever, and they got comfortable with that. But here's the one thing you can't do on TV or on your smartphone or your iPad or your laptop. You can't create the kinetic energy that's here this morning. It's impossible. It's like, do you want to go watch the Rolling Stones on Apple TV or do you want to go sit front row? It's a big difference. Huge difference. And so we need to be here. We, we belong to God's family. So that's why we're here. And it's really important that we are together. First Corinthians 11, 18, 20 says, I hear that there are divisions among you when you meet as a church. This is Paul kind of scolding the Corinthians. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. For as you eat it, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One member goes hungry among you while another gets drunk. Sound familiar in our culture today? It's the same kind of thing. So dear brothers and sisters, when you gather for Lord's Supper, wait for each other. So you do it in community. You do it as a, as a, as a body of Christ. And I think it's really important to know that. Number three, the spirit of Jesus lives inside me. And I, what, you know, what happens when I forget this fact is that I go astray when I, when I lose sight of this truth, that the spirit of Jesus lives inside me. I, I just never want to lose sight of that. It's just so important. John 6, 56 through 57 says, Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood live in me, and I live in them. The living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So whoever eats me will live because of me. And so this mystery of faith, this mystery of communion is, you know, we're partaking in a reminder and remembrance of what the cross is, what Jesus' life meant, but also that Jesus is dwelling inside me. Number four, the life is not the end of the story. This isn't just it. Ron Bradley, his life didn't end, it just began. You know, this earthly life is short. Even if you live to be 100 years old and get your face on a smucker's jar. You know, even if you make it. Yes, I got my, I'm on a jelly jar. You, you make it to that. It's just the beginning. Eternity's forever. And so do we know that? Jesus is coming back to judge and reward everything. We see that in John 6, 53, 54. Unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them at that last day. Just like you raised Ron Bradley. And just like he'll raise you. And that's another part of communion. You see how this all fits together? I mean, it's easy just to go through the, the simple great thanksgiving and the hymnal and miss really the big, big picture of what God's trying to tell us here. And lastly, Jesus is coming back one day to judge and reward. So these five parts of communion are things that we're all going at the same time as we celebrate communion today. Past, present, and future in communion. And it's important. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. That you are part of the kingdom of God being spread and coming back. So, so many times we think about it or it's taught, or we, we assume that it's a future experience. It's going on right now. You are part of this bringing this, this salvation to earth. You're part of that right now. As a Jesus-centered follower and living a Jesus-centered life, this is what we're about. And so as we close out today, I'm going to invite you to stand, and we're going to pray, and we're going to say the Lord's Prayer, and we're going to go to our time of communion. If you've never been to communion with us, we use grape juice, mainly for our friends in recovery. We have regular bread, but we also have a gluten-free option, and it's in a, in, a, in a smaller bowl up front. So if you prefer a gluten-free option when you come forward, it, it'll be right there. Um, when you come forward, Susie's going to help serve today, so she'll give you a piece of bread, or I will, and we'll say this is the body of Christ given for you. And then we'll offer you a juice cup. And this will be the blood of Christ given for you. This altar is open. This space is open. I mean, you're, whether it's your pew, the privacy of your own heart, right here, right now, you can use this space to practice what we talked about this morning. There's dispensers at the end of the, 
of the altar for you to get rid of your juice cups. But know that you're invited. If you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are welcome to participate in communion this morning. So I want to pray for us, and then I'm going to segue us into the Lord's Prayer, where I'll ask you to join me, and then we're going to celebrate communion together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for this 40 days of prayer. We all need to up our game in our prayer life, and whether it's just to refresh it, whether it's to, to grow it, whether it's just to have intimacy with you at a much deeper level, all kinds of reasons. But help us to see you in a multidimensional way in all the things we lifted up today, that you're everywhere, you're omnipresent, and we just got to look, and we will experience it with our sixth sense. So we pray for that today. We pray for our hearts. We pray for our minds. We pray as we come forward that we confess to you the privacy of our hearts, our darkness, our shortcomings, defects, our sin. And we ask for your mercy and your grace and your forgiveness. And we pray that we recognize the five things that we lifted up about communion today and that we can take that with us as we go out. That you dwell inside us and that you choose as kingdom people to live your life through us. Help us to get out of the way of ourselves and allow the Holy Spirit to do that through us. We pray this boldly and we pray it in your son's name. Amen. We're going to join in the Lord's Prayer. You all know that prayer. Let's share that together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is Harold. Thanks for listening to our weekly message and podcast. I hope that we have shared something helpful to you wherever you are in your spiritual journey. Just so you know a little bit more about us, we are Hill Tran United. Hill Tran United is an alliance between Hillsboro United Methodist Church and Transformation United Methodist Church. We are kingdom churches and kingdom communities for people who aren't into church. We meet Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. at Hillsboro United Methodist Church and 11 a.m. at Transformation United Methodist Church. Both churches are located in the northeastern tip of the beautiful Ozark Mountains, located in Jefferson County, Missouri. We also meet during the week in smaller groups that we call life groups and home churches, and that's how we make it relational. We hear regularly from people from all over who are engaging in personal and group studies based on our teaching, and we would love to know if that is happening where you are at. If you want to connect with us, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Vimeo, and YouTube, where you can download our app from your favorite app store. Just search for the app titled Our Church by Church Dev and enter in Hilltran United and you can access all of our available audio, video teachings, plus through the app you can, and our, or our website, you can download our PowerPoint slides, bulletin, sermon notes, and discussion questions. It's all there for you. And lastly, if you want to learn more about how you can support Hillsboro United Methodist Church or Transformation United Methodist Church financially, please go to www.hilltran.com dot org for more information and to give we appreciate anything you can do to help hey thanks for being a member of this extended church family i'm glad we are in this together as kingdom people commencing shoulder to shoulder to help people rediscover life and experience the kingdom of god